Okay, traders, welcome to the next installment in our online education series with me, Patrick Munley. Um, if you can see the uh, Tickmail welcome screen and you can hear me loud and clear, could you type a Y in the chat box just to let me know that uh, we don't have any sound or audio issues? Good stuff. Okay. Welcome everyone. Um, as always, we're going to uh, we're get things going here um, by just familiarising ourselves once again with the disclaimer. As we know, um, foreign exchange trading is uh, is a it's a high risk endeavour, but we're certainly looking to to mitigate those risks by participating in these online education sessions, whereby we are learning. About relevant information that can help us better define our trading strategy and trade plan and overall better manage our risks when we are trading the markets. So um, just for, for those who, who don't know who I am, a quick introduction to the context in which I'm, uh, I'm presenting here today. My name is, is Patrick Munley. I've been, um, been trading now for 15 years. Um, after I graduated, I uh, went into the world of consulting. I eventually did a, a startup that, um, that experienced some pretty rapid growth, and I exited that startup um, post a merger. Had a bunch of uh, time on my hand and some capital to, to play with, and um, I started to explore my passion for markets. And uh, I was trading in a market that was predominantly trending, trending north, and I had some some lucky early breaks and started to make some uh, some significant capital but then as is often the story with um with the beginner's luck syndrome um, mine ran out and uh and i experienced uh, some significant losses which led to me really reconsidering how i was approaching um the, the trading world or, or the markets indeed and I, um, I decided to make the move to, to becoming a professional trader. I sought out a, a mentor who uh, demonstrated excellence in the field of trading and worked closely with, um, with my mentor to ultimately um, improve not just my technical game, but more importantly, my mental game. Um, through this process, I developed a trade plan underpinned by a rigorous mis risk management strategy, uh, full back test and forward test, and I set about uh, implementing that strategy um, in 2008. Since 2008, I have uh, I've been consistently profitable on an annual basis. Um, that's not to say that, uh, that I don't have periods of drawdown or, or losses, but on an annualized basis, I've um, I've had positive returns, and really um, that's really my scorecard in terms of my my personal performance. I'm not concerned about the outcome of a of a, a small. Um, sample of trades. I'm looking at uh, the next 50 or 100 trades. Will my edge demonstrate itself over that period? And if so, with uh, with the appropriate risk management skills, then I can uh, I can certainly uh, expect to um, to receive positive returns. Since 2013, I've also been managing external capital um, through a managed account service, which I've been running, like I say, since 2013. And on that gain on an annualized basis, that's been profitable. Um, I've also uh, mentored over 100 private traders, various experience levels from um, total newbies, really, to, to guys who've been trading on the CME floor in the pits in Chicago, who were making the transition to the, the screens. Um, and I've really helped uh, mentor traders for defining uh, a trading strategy that fits their personality and their risk profile and working with them to how best to execute that strategy um, in a mentor mentoring role. I, um, as well as being a resident expert at Tickmill, market experts, I'm also the head of trading and trader education for a proprietary trading firm called Little Fish FX and head of trading education for a firm called fxcareerswap.com who, um, who have a program that basically educates traders and then looks to fund um, emerging retail trading talents. Um, but like I said, you, you, you can check in with me on LinkedIn, um, contact me through there if you have any questions about uh, 
any as any aspects of anything um, I've just mentioned, I'm more than happy to uh, to give you further information um, offline. But uh, with respect to today, we are heading into the second uh, section or part two of um, of this pattern recognition process. So we're going to um, jump off the The slides, and once again, we're going to um, we're going to move into into the charts today as we look to um, to increase our knowledge about how to recognise practically uh, practical trading patterns that occur um, on all time frames and uh, and have a high frequency and also offer a high probability outcome. So just to to refresh ourselves from from last week. What we were looking at was the, um, the initial criteria for a corrective pattern. Um, and what we wanted to do was basically to be able to ascertain whether the pattern conditions um, were met that typically warn a correction is at or near completion. And then once we understand that the correction is at or near completion, we are able to, with high probability, predict what is likely to follow from the completion of a correction. Now, this, this information is useful to us, and what by useful, what I mean is, is it can be profitable to us, because if we're aware that the market is, is making a correction, we understand or we can glean information from that correction in terms of the position of the market with respect to the market phase that is likely to follow. So if we're in a corrected phase, what we're likely to see then is trend continuation. So there are two important pieces of information that we want uh, our patent to tell us. Is a market in trend or correction? And what is the position of the market within that trend or correction? So when we're tackling whether a market's in trend or correction, what we first want to do is have a very simple piece of information that can be very helpful to our trade strategy once we identify the pattern. The key is to identify if the market is making a correction. And why is that? Well, if a market is making a correction, it should not take out the extreme that began the prior trend, but should eventually continue in the direction of the prior trend and make a new extreme in that direction. Okay. So last week, as we know, we looked at these ABC patterns and we had some very specific rules that we can follow that help us to identify whether we're in the corrective phase. These being that the wave C should exceed the extreme of wave A. So let's draw in here uh, these, this pattern so we can just track, refresh ourselves with, um, with this pattern. So we have a low, we have a corrective high, which is the A point. Then we have a reaction low. So we don't make a new low in, uh, in price. And then we take out the A point, and then we're watching for a C point to suggest that the correction is over, okay? Now, one of the key pieces of information that we, we learned last week in terms of how we can best define whether or not we're in a corrective phase is this idea of the market overlapping, okay? So once, we have made, once we've identified our ABC pattern, once price trades back into the A wave region, we can, with relatively high level of certainty, predict that the current corrective phase has come to a conclusion and we are likely to resume with the dominant trend. So we identify the trend prior to the correction, which in this instance is to the downside. We know that the waves within this um, trend move don't overlap but we know that there is overlapping action in the correction and that suggests that the trend will continue. Now, note again that these, what, what we're looking at here and these, these patterns are, um, are about real world practical application. There is no technical analysis technique or pattern or signal or trade strategy that works on every occasion because a market may run against an ideal setup. An ideal pattern that usually results in a corrective high or low may be followed by a strong trend of continuation. So we want to remember that in the business of trading, our role as traders is to identify conditions with a high probability outcome 
and an acceptable account risk. We will not be right all the time, okay? But we should be right more often than we are wrong. And then when we have the correct risk reward profile in place, that will lead to positive returns over time, okay? So we want to bear in mind, these are our rules for a corrected pattern. So if the market trades back into the range of wave A, the minimum condition for a correction is complete, i.e. we are likely to resume trends. The third and final rule, a trade, uh, as we trade beyond the wave B extreme, the pattern signal for the correction should be complete, i.e. once we take out the B, the B swing low, more often than not, that means we will make a low below the low of the prior trends. Is everyone following along so far? If you could type a, a Y in the chat box, if this is all making sense. So we have our three basic rules here that we're going to apply when we're looking at corrections. And what we're going to move on to today is we are going to identify what happens when an, a simple or an ideal correction fails. And then we're going to move into how we identify trend conditions, okay? So let's review what happens when we don't get a, um, a simple correction, i.e. the ABC, we actually get something called a complex correction. So a complex correction is a correction that occurs in more than three waves, okay? Now, Elliott Wave academics or theorists have gone to the trouble of identifying 13 potential complex corrections, okay? We are not going to be examining the patterns of complex corrections today, or, or it, it simply is not a, an exercise that is really worth your time, because what we want is information that we can quickly apply to give us, to make relatively straightforward trading decisions. All we want to do is recognize that a correction is probably, probably being made. If we can do that, we know to orientate our trading approach to trade against the direction of the correction for a probable continuation of the trend to either a new high or a new low once the correction is complete. Now, a complex correction typically has several sections that overlap. And that's the key again. We're focused on this nature of overlapping sections. Once we identify that the market should be making a corrective pattern, then we know with relative certainty that the eventual trend to a new high or new low will take place and we can, we can enter our trades accordingly. Now, obviously, it's relatively easy to show these after the fact examples, but just remember what you need to pay attention to here. The key concept is that if the sections overlap, more likely a correction is being made. So that information itself is very valuable and will help you to identify the probable position of a market for the next major trend move. The overlap will be an important signal to trade direction. As soon as a market makes the overlap, it is a strong pattern signal that a correction is being made. The market may continue in a complex correction, making, as I've said, several overlaps. Throughout the strategy, what we want to do is identify the end of the correction in order to position for a trade in the direction of the trend. We don't need to look at hundreds of examples of ABC and complex corrections, since there is just one guiding principle to being able to identify if the market is making a correction. And that is simply that once the section overlaps, it's an alert signal that the market should be making a correction. While a market may continue to trade higher or lower, depending upon the direction of the correction, the overlapping sections continue to signal that the market is still in corrective mode and that it should make a new extreme, and that it will eventually continue in the direction of the trend. So we learned last week that the corrections are usually in three sections. Now we're going to look at a complex correction, which basically sees this pattern duplicate. So if we look here, we previously used our ABC as our corrective guideline. Now more often than not, and again, what we are thinking in here is simply in terms of probabilities, we, we can't deal in certainties because the market is an uncertain environment. 
But more often than not, when we have a complex correction, the complex correction will occur in a double ABC. So, and for the purposes of, of ease in terms of marking this, and because it's a, a tool that TradingView give, we will we'll term the correction A, B, C, D, and E. Okay? Now, another important piece of information we can use here to help identify when the correction is likely complete is the Fibonacci retracement tool. Now, what the levels we're interested in in terms of the Fibonacci retracement tool are the 38.2%, the 50%, and the 78.6%. Okay? Now, let me explain to you how we use these, these levels to help us identify when that high probability correction is coming to an end. What we know is that if our ABC correction, okay, so this is our A, this is our B, and this is the C swing low, if that only trades to the 38.2% retracement of the prior trend, then that is a high probability scenario that we're actually going to make a complex correction, i.e. we're likely to see another C, uh, where I e were likely to see a D and an E leg. They, the D and E leg, should at a minimum test the 50% retracement level. Okay. If, if the correction exceeds the 78.6% retracement, then more likely than not, the trend has failed. Okay. So let me just let me just go back over those rules so we're clear on them in terms of how we can differ, how we can help to identify when we are likely to see a complex correction. The complex correction is a double ABC or for the ease of reference, ABCDE pattern that I've highlighted on the chart here. Let me get rid of, um, of this for a second so we can just focus. That's the actual trend. We're going to look at the, um, the properties of the trend so we can identify that in a minute. But just for the purposes of understanding a complex correction, let's overlay our fib tool. And what we have here is an AB, ABC low that trades just to the 38.2% retracement. Once we get a reaction from that 38.2% retracement to a, a swing high, which we, we're terming D here, once we break that C low, we then know that we're, in a com we're likely in a complex correction. Um, as a minimum, we're looking for price to test the 50% retracement. Okay. So once we get that 50% retracement, we then are alerted to the high probability scenario that the trend, that the correction is now complete. Certainly, once we take out the D point, we're getting further information. We're trading back into the B leg. And once we take out our B point high, the pattern is pretty much confirmed. Does that make sense to everyone? Can you type a Y in the chat box if you're following along? Well, I just quickly take a sip of water. Here. Okay, so now we understand what a complex correction is. What we're now going to do is we're going to move into identifying the key properties of a trend pattern. Okay, so we've we've got a sim we've got two pieces of information so far that we can use to identify what phase the market is in. We've got a simple correction, which is an ABC pattern, which we can see down here, ABC, and then we have a complex correction, which is an ABCDE pattern that should test the 50% retracement area, but should not exceed the 78.6% retracement. Okay. Now let's look at the criteria for trend. So here we have three simple rules that are going to help us identify where, when we are in a trend section. Trends usually make up five sections, and the sections do not overlap. Now, in Elliott wave terms, a trend is called an impulse wave. We're going to stick with that term trend because all that we are concerned with in using this pattern guideline is to identify two basic market conditions. Are we trending or are we in correction? 
We've used letters to label the sections of a correction. We have waves A, B, C, D, E, etc. Now we're going to use numbers to identify the sections of a trend, such as wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, and wave five. And like I said, trend usually makes up five sections. There are three rules we want to adhere to, as we did with our um, corrective patterns. Firstly, wave two cannot trade beyond the beginning of wave one. Okay, so wave two, which we've identified here, cannot exceed the beginning of the first wave. So this is the first wave, this is the move off the lows. Wave two cannot exceed that move, okay? Wave three, which is this pattern here, this leg to, up to the three point, cannot be the shortest in price of waves one, three, and five, okay? So this is wave one, this is wave five, and this is wave three. So we cannot be the shortest, wave three cannot be the shortest out of those one, three, and five sections. Now, important here, this is a difference from, this is a slight difference for any of you who've had prior experience with Elliott Wave. Wave four cannot make a close into the closing range of wave one. So in this instance, wave four, to close within the range of, of wave one, would have to close down here, okay? So that would negate the potential of whatever corrective pattern we're seeing here being a wave four. Now, the other rule we have is that we don't want our um, corrective patterns to exceed a 78.6% retracement, okay? So that also helps us, but just in terms of the simple idea, we don't want a wave four with it closing, not saying it can test or probe into the area, but on a closing basis, whatever time frame we're trading, we don't want wave four to close within the range of wave one. Okay? Because what you'll often see, and this is what confuses those people who are, um, are who are simply uh, taking Elliott wave to the uh, to the letter, is that. The, over the years, you'll see that the market may make a few ticks into the wave one range and then continue with the trend and complete an otherwise ideal five wave trend so many times that I, I, that we work with the modification of that rule as, it's, as it will serve you well over, the, over the, your trading career. So before we learn about the most typical trend pattern, let's make something very clear. Not every trend makes a five wave pattern that conforms to the trend guidelines, okay? So just like with our corrections, we, we, not every trend pattern is going to meet the, the trend guidelines, okay? The momentum, price, and time position will also help us identify the next swing and potential for the trend pattern. So we've got to keep the, you know, we really want to avoid um, getting caught up in the idea of labeling waves or sections. We want to have a simple logical approach. We don't want to fall into the Elliott wave paralysis by analysis trap. We are only interested in two types of patterns that are useful to help us understand the position of the market and then allow us to make practical trading decisions. We don't want to become an Elliott wave expert as such. All we want to be able to do is use simple logic on what trends and corrections usually look like and what guidelines to use to recognize the probable position of the market within a trend or a correction, as well as a probable outcome. An emphasis on this word probable, okay? We want to think in a logical step-by-step -step fashion as new data is added. We don't want to have any complex counting systems. We don't want detailed subdivisions of subdivisions and waves and different degrees. We just want to know a couple of simple patterns that are reliable and how, we, and how best to recognize them as the market unfolds, okay? So when we're looking at trends, as we, we can see one other chart here, price makes a high out of the swing low, okay? When, we make, when the momentum tool, so this is, how, this is a, a, a great, piece of objective information you can use if you're concerned about whether or not you think that the current 
um, pullback is a correction. When we make a momentum low here versus this move off the lows, as we make the new momentum low, we do not make a new low in price. Okay. Now, if, for example, we made the momentum low and this was the price action, let me just draw this in for you. This will be helpful just to clarify the point. So if we if the price action looked like this, let's pull this over, pull that down there like that, move that a little bit. So if when we made this new new low in momentum or this secondary low in momentum versus this low, price had broken to new lows, then the idea that we're in a correction would, would be false or invalid. But what we can do is we can, like I said, we can use our momentum tool to help us clarify objectively as to whether or not we've seen a correction. Now, what we know is that at the minimum we're looking for an A, B, C pattern. So we get that on this secondary low. Okay. So once we trade back into the range of, of the A wave, then we've got that overlapping scenario. Okay, so this is key. We, we want to focus on whether or not we are overlapping in price. And as you can see quite clearly, here we are. And so we have an ABC pattern. Let's bring in our FIB tool now from the low to the high. It falls within the ideal level for the correction to complete, which is in the 50 to 78.6% retracement area. And then price trades back into the A range and ultimately up through B, and so we have a confirmation. So now we have a wave, we can mark this now as a potential wave one, okay? So we have this level marked as our wave one, and now we have a second, a wave two, we have the wave two structure learned, okay? With the correction. Once we take out this high here, then we have further confirmation that we are likely seeing a third wave move to the upside. Okay, and all we all we need to do then is track this pattern as we trade into the into this this area. We know now that this, as we traded back into this area, that this can't be the third wave because it's it's shorter than our wave one. So we don't need to mark that as a, as a, we don't need to mark it yet until we take out the high here. Now we've got a potential wave three because the wave three is longer than wave one. So we can start to track the, the pullbacks. Now, again, we pull back here, but we don't test the 50% retracement. Once we make the new low momentum, we continue to make new highs. So each time we can overlay our third wave identification to see, are we getting a pullback? And again, we don't get that pullback to the 50%. So this third wave is still developing, okay? And we're getting our, our pullbacks in our momentum, but we're not even testing the 50% retracement, okay? So this is alerting us to the idea that we are not, that the pattern has not completed. And we continue to track the swing highs. We don't get the pullback. We don't get a pullback. Here, we get an overlapping structure again. So we have an A, a B, and a C, confirmed with our momentum. So now we have a potential wave three completion, and then we're looking ultimately for a wave five. Now, once we've got a wave five in place, then we know we have the potential for another corrective phase to develop versus the trends. And here we have an ABC pattern. Again, we get um, objective confirmation through the use of our momentum, our momentum tool, the stochastic RSI. And from the beginning of this section to here, we bring in our um, FIB retracements. We can see we trade into a 50% retracement, and then we ultimately make new highs. Does that make sense to everyone? Can we type a Y in the chat box if you're following how we can logically track the development of the trend? So these, 
These fifth waves are the key because the most valuable piece of information regarding trends is that once waves one through four are confirmed, the trend should be in its final stages. The trade to a new high in this bullish trend confirms the wave four should be complete and the upside should be limited before a wave five high is complete which should complete the bullish trend. If a market is making new highs, the natural inclination for traders is to be very bullish. This is a good inclination in the early stages of a trend. It can be very costly inclination in the latter stages of a trend. But if we are aware of all the guidelines to complete waves one through four have been met, the swing to a new high could be that wave five and probably the last swing in that section. Okay, in that trend move. This information will be a huge advantage and can help us to prepare for a major top or at least a reversal, just as more traders are actually getting bullish. If we just focus on this one pattern tendency of trends to usually make at least five sections with no overlaps, that information alone will be of enormous benefit if four sections are already complete. As if a market is in a probable wave five, the next momentum reversal could be the early signal that wave five is complete and we can adjust our trade management strategies accordingly. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to move into uh, another chart here. I think I've got a chart. This is, uh, this is an Australian dollar chart. This is just last year's price action. Uh, sorry, 20, 2018 through to 2019. What I wanted to do now is just walk you through how we can track a trend development and how we can use our tools and the information that we've gleaned from, from today's session to help trade that trend pattern. So once we break down from the high using our momentum tool, we get our first corrective low. Now we have two ways of identifying um, whether we're making a correction. First is, do we trade into a 50% retracement? And through that process, are there any overlapping waves? Well, we can see here if we mark up our swing points, we have our low, we have our high, we then pull back, which is the overlap, into the C point. So from a simple trading perspective here, once we identify that we have an overlapping structure into our C point, we could, as a, as a trading strategy, employ a entry point at the 50% retracement and a stop just above the 78.6% retracement. Okay, so this is I'm just showing you how you can apply some simple rules to develop a relatively straightforward trading strategy using the information we've learned in these past two sessions. So we know that if we trade through the 78.6% retracement, then likely the, the trend has failed and we're going to move through the prior extreme high. But if we hold this 78.6% retracement, entering at a 50% retracement, once we've been able to identify a three-wave move into the 50% retracement, we know that if we get that three-wave move, then more likely than not, from a probabilistic perspective, we've either completed a simple correction or we are in a potential complex correction, but we still should not exceed that 78.6% retracement. Now, we enter at the, at the uh, so in this instance here, we pull back, we trade into the 79.49 level, we have a stop at 80.59, and our first target is a retest of the prior swing lows. Okay, now we can use that as our exit point because that's giving us about a 1.5 times risk reward or we can I look for the new swing loads we made and target the 1.272 extension okay so this is the 1.272 of the range which is ultimately when we get down to this level is actually giving us nearly a three times risk reward on the trade okay so once we've made our corrective high here, we watch for a new low, we get a new low in the RSI, uh, sorry, in the RSI stochastic, which is our momentum tool. And then what we're looking for is how the price action unfolds. It, can we see waves, overlapping waves, or, uh, are, or are we potentially in, in a new trend? Well, here, from our prior swing high in the last correction, we put our 
uh, bits all over. And then can we identify an overlapping move? Well, we can here, and then we get our C point there. Okay. So again, we enter at the 50% retracement, and our stop is at the 78.6% retracement. We're looking for a move down. Once we trade to the prior swing lows, we can move our stops to our entry point and cover our risk on the trade, meaning it's risk-free. And then we're looking ultimately for a test of, this, of the 1.272 extension. So new lows confirming that the trend remains intact. So we get that new low, get a pullback. We don't exceed our prior swing highs. Now, is this pullback corrective in nature? Well, we can clearly see an overlap. And once again, we apply the same process. We overlay our Fibonacci retracement. We enter at the 50% retracement. Once you've identified this AB structure, so that overlap, suggesting that we're likely in a, in a correction. And then we trade up into a C point high that doesn't exceed the 78.6% retracement. Everyone following along so far, yeah? Then we get a new low as per the RSI. So this is giving us an objective signal that a new low has been made. We don't have to um, be you know, scrutinizing the charts. We're just watching for this new low. Once we get a new low, we overlay our Fib retracement tool versus the new low. And then we're watching for how price reacts against that low. So we get a reaction high that's at the 38.2% retracement. Now, what do we know about 38.2% retracement? Well, more often than not, price is not going to stall out there, but we can use that, that resistance area to give us information about whether or not we're going to see a complex correction. Because if we stall out at 38.2% retracement and we don't make a new low and we take out that 38.2% retracement high, then again, we've got confirmation that we're likely in a complex correction. So we use our tool. Now we're looking for an ABCD pattern. So here we have our A, our B, our C, our D, and our E. So we can, with relative safety, enter at the 50% retracement using the 78.6% retracement as a stop because we know that statistically we should not take out that 78.6% retracement if we are in trend. Okay, and we've got that confirmation through the overlapping nature of the price action that we're in a correction. We're continuing to make high, uh, lower lows and, and lower highs. Okay, even here, although it's complex, we don't take out a 78.6% retracement. We move down, we test the, the price swing lower support, consolidate, but then ultimately break down through the consolidation to our target zone. And then we're left to watch the price action again. So here we make a swing low, a swing high into a swing low as per um, the Fibonacci, uh, sorry, as per the RSI stochastic in terms of once we traded through the through the 20% 20, 20 level to the downside, we have a swing low. And then we're waiting at, to see, do we get overlapping price action? Well, we do here, we get a swing high and a pullback and we get a C point here, but in reality, we probably don't get filled on that trade. So again, we're not going to catch all these moves, and obviously, this this section of price action is is particularly furtive. And I've used this so you can see, you can start to train your eye to see the patterns. But it's not always going to work perfectly, as we know. But in this instance, we probably don't get an entry, but the trade does work out as per the rules. So what we're watching for now is the next swing low using the RSI stochastic to help us identify that level. And we get a breakdown into the next swing low here. Once we're trading up into the 50% here, we have no overlapping price action. So there isn't an opportunity for us to get into that trade because it doesn't meet the criteria, but we're continuing to make lower lows and lower highs. So we know but the market is still in the downtrend and we continue to track the price action. So now we have this swing high and we have this swing low. And there we've got our confirmation with the stochastic RSI. And what do we have? An A, B, C. Okay. Now, in this instance, we come pretty close, we're just below our stop. 
So we get another trade here. We trade down into the area where we move our stops to break even, but ultimately we don't get filled on our target and we get taken out for a risk for, uh, for a break even trade. And then ultimately on this swing here, we don't get our overlapping price action. What we get is a sharp move up through the 78.6% of the trades, and so we don't get a trade signal there. So in this section of price action where we saw trend developing, we're able to trade with that trend just using some of these simple pieces of information that we've covered in the past two pattern sessions. Does that make sense to everyone? You can type a Y in the chat box if you're following along. That concludes the, 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 the second section here of the, the pattern recognition. I hope you found this useful. I'm free now um, for the next few minutes to answer any questions you've got with respect to uh, anything we've discussed in the past two, two sessions. Aruna, I've never used FIBS before. Can you clarify where to position after making the ABC? Yeah, so it's quite simple, Aruna. The, um, once you've got the ABC, that's your swing point from which you're going to measure into the next low. So once we have this, C, uh, this ABC, we measure down to the low as per the low made. Once we take out these lows, we have a new swing low. Using the RSI stochastic, this can help just um, give you uh, an objective way of seeing that. So then we're measuring from that C high to, the, to the, this point low, and then we're watching for overlapping price action as we trade into the 50% retracement. So that gives us our entry level. We have a stop, a logical stop, because we know that uh, corrections should not exceed the 78.6% retracement. And then we're watching the price action for an ABC pattern again. Now we break down. So what we do, once we take out this low, we're using our C point swing high as the last swing high. We also get that confirmation with our RSI stochastic. And then we have the RSI stochastic back down below 20% level, and so that gives us our next swing low point to measure. Does that make sense? Yeah, the webinar is um, is recorded, and the other webinars are also recorded. I'll uh, you can access them through the Tipmill YouTube site. Uh, the RSI stochastic, uh, Felix. The settings are 3, 3, 14, 14 on the close. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I'll, uh, I'll wrap this session up here. Um, next week, we're going to look um, at, at how we can use our Fibonacci tool um, without uh, beyond just the retracements. So today we've obviously focused quite a bit on Fibonacci retracements. Next week we're going to look at how we can use the Fib tool for extension for targets um, to help identify targets in our trades and potential areas of reversal. Yeah, there's a YouTube channel. Um, if you bear with me one second, I will uh, I'll post it in the chat. Give me one second here. Um, here we go. Uh, give me one second, guys. I'm just uh, trying to pull the link up for you now. Um, so you mean you can access? Yeah, you can access all the recordings. Um, I'm just going to give you the link for the for, uh, for, lo for last week. So I also um, you can follow along. I produce a weekly market outlook, uh, which you might find useful as well. I'll post a couple of links here so you can start to follow along. You can also register um, for updates. Uh, via my author section let me that's probably easiest uh, now.
you can uh, you can receive email alerts. Let's just see if this is going to work. Can you see in the chat there? I've just posted um, it's uh, blog.tigmail.com forward slash author forward slash Patrick. You can receive email alerts now for all of my um, content that I, I share on, on Tickmill. And I'll also make sure that, um, that the guys uh, also send you um, the links for prior recordings once you've registered um, and you subscribe to my posts. Okay. Session's been useful. Like I say, next week we're going to look uh, beyond Fibonacci retracements and we're going to start to, to look at extensions. Thanks very much for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your week.